Good to see everybody out tonight. Is it hot enough for you? Fry an egg on a sidewalk. I haven't tried that yet. Let's remember some prayer requests. Um, I have several here that I'm just going to read to you. Uh, this is last week's list, and we'll just update it as we go. Um, I want to continue to remember Richie Vick in our prayers. Uh, Lucas Williams, we've been praying for that young man. Um, he's on life support again. He, he had taken a step forward, and he's taken a step back. So remember him. Bonnie Gilbert, Barbara Colsey, also Lisa Grant. We want to continue to remember her. Um, Gloria Bonds got to come home today, so praise God for that. Um, we want to remember Libby Stevenson's a little baby, about s maybe four weeks old. Um, she's been battling for her life up in Cardinal Glennon. Uh, kind of continue to remember Sue Miracle, Ray Gurley. Um, see, there's several that do have COVID, and everybody seems to be fairly mild, so we want to continue to pray that that will swing through and pass us all. Um, what other prayer requests do we have tonight? Jeff? Ashton's having surgery. Les? I, okay, good. Yeah, Natalie. I've got, actually, I've got Mike and Natalie on here. I'm glad you're here. Lois? Oh, gosh. I'm sorry to hear that. Well, that wasn't the one that was just here, right? Okay. All right. Frank? Sarah. Sarah and Reagan, yes, sir. Ronnie Almerold. All righty. And Haley, amen. Remember our Mexico crew? They had a kind of a rough week so far, but they're doing better now. Um, Terry had got a UTI as soon as she got down there, and she had to go to the doctor. And then Sharon fell in the park and dislocated her arm. Um, but I saw, I talked to Ben on the phone. I said, Ben, when he was here, I said, how dangerous is it down there? And he's like, well, it's, he's like, you'd be worse off in Chicago. And I said, listen, I talked to Ben. I said, Ben, I said, two out of five have had to go to the hospital already. So, um, anyway, they're, they're doing good work. They're heading up to the mountains for the next two days to minister down there. Um, I know they've been able to lead one person to the Lord. So praise God for that. And they've been, it looks like they're having a, really good time and a profitable time and so I'm looking forward to hearing hearing how that goes and I know they've been a great encouragement to Ben and the crew down there um, any other prayer requests before we pray tonight Jacob Jimmy Snyder absolutely and his family yep I put her on here Bonnie Gilbert and uh, Barbara Colsey yes ma'am yeah, and Lisa? No, Lisa, she sits over here on Sunday mornings. Greg, yeah, Greg, you want to tell people your good news? Go ahead. <laughs> Praise the Lord, man. That's wonderful. Brad? I don't remember Braden in his troop. I'll do it. Remember. Janice Lowe, and also remember Louise, she's been having some trouble with her ears and dizziness. Yes, ma'am. 
No, but I need to announce it. I'm glad you said that. Those of you who are with us on Facebook, Brother Greg Bowles announced that he is now cancer-free, so praise God for that. That's what all the clapping was about. Amen. All right, well, we will go to the Lord in prayer, and then we will get started. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful tonight that we can come into your house and that we can gather here together. Lord, tonight we lift up these requests to you, each and every one of them, and we thank you, God, for being a God who hears and answers prayers. And so tonight, Lord, we just uh, bring these to your throne. We pray for each one of these physical situations and conditions. We pray, dear God, Lord, that you touch them. We pray, Lord, for those who are battling life-threatening um, illnesses. We pray, dear God, Lord, for your miraculous touch. Lord, I pray that they may live and may not die in Jesus' name. I pray, God, and we know that you're the giver of life. And so, Lord, I pray, God, that you touch their bodies. I pray for those who are recovering from surgery. I pray, dear God, Lord, for those who are getting ready to travel and facing different and going different things and through different things. We pray, dear God, for them and for those families. God, I thank you for the wonderful news, the wonderful healing of Brother Greg's body. And we just give you glory to that, and we thank you for that. And uh, we're just so glad that we can testify to that tonight and witness it. Lord, we thank you for touching Gloria and letting her feel better. And God, I just pray, Lord, that you just be with us throughout this evening. Be with Brother Dave as he ministers to us tonight. And we just love you and praise you in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. So I've got trivia tonight. I have been, when Gloria called on Friday morning and they were flying her, or Monday morning and flying her to St. Louis, um, I didn't want her to be alone, so I took off up there. And then yesterday, uh, I didn't get home till late Monday night. Then yesterday, her daughter um, was flying in. And she didn't have a ride from the airport, so I drove back up there and brought her back last night. And I thought that she would be able to drive Gloria's car, but she's not big on driving in the in the uh, in St. Louis. And so I drove her back there today. So I, I've I've witnessed St. Louis three times this week, and my goal is I'm not going to go there tomorrow. Um, but anyway, so Brother Dave is gonna is gonna teach for us tonight, minister to us. But before we do that, Olivia. It's trivia time. All right. Olivia, do you want first question tonight? Like your your team. Okay. All right. Here we go. Here we go. Here we go. To what man does the final sentence of Genesis refer? The final sentence reads like this. He was put in a coffin in Egypt. To what man does the final sentence of Genesis refer? The final sentence reads like this. He was put in a coffin in Egypt. Think about it. Joseph is correct. This delay, come on. That's their mama. They brought her in special tonight. <laughs> Ringer. <laughs> All right. Question number one for Eastside. What was the name of the Roman leader who destroyed the temple of Jerusalem? This is a hard one. Because immediately you would go with Nero, but Nero's not it. They're not going to get it, trust me. It's a okay. <laughs> there are no danger of getting this question right. Who? No, it's Titus. All right, one to nothing. You ready, Miss Delay? Okay. Which prophetic, and did I say that name right? The lie. Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> the lie. Which prophetic book concludes with God saying about the Israelites, I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them? Which prophetic book concludes with God saying about the Israelites, I will plant them upon their land, and they shall no more be pulled up out of their land which I have given them? Ty? No. It's Amos. 
Amos, the book of Amos. All right, time to tie it up. Amos and Andy, I know Amos and Andy, yeah. That's, that's my namesake. No, <laughs> I'm really, <laughs> all right. <laughs> that's two different, completely different things. Um, name the second wife of Abraham. Roland says Zophar. You guys want to go with that, or it's incorrect? You got it, Shirley. What is it? Keturah is correct. Yeah, Keturah. No, there's, there's no bonus points. It was good that she got it right, but there's no bonus points. Yeah, that was good. Yeah, we <laughs> for the steal. All right, it's one to nothing. You guys, which book closes with this statement? Every man did what was right in his own eyes. Which book closes with this statement? Every man did what was right in his own eyes. I know that one. I'm going to, I'm not going to look until it's time. Judges is what I think too, and we are all right. <clears throat> Two to nothing. Which book concludes by stating that Jesus did so many works that the world can, can't contain the books that should be written? Which book concludes by stating that Jesus did so many works that the world can't contain the books that should be written? John, talking about John the Revelator. All right, two to one. Which book says the Lord gave and the Lord hath taken away? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Job. Then you guys are on a roll tonight. Three to one. Why did Abimelech ask his servants to kill him? That's close. It's very close. Can you elaborate on that army or the enemy? Yeah, but why? Why? Yeah, but what's special about that army? Huh? Yeah. He didn't want to be killed by a woman. Judges 9, 54. Yeah. All right, still three to one. Chance to go up four to one. This is huge, West Side. I don't know that you guys have ever had a lead like this before. Ever. How did God designate 300 soldiers Oh, that's not yours. Sorry, that's the next one. How many days did Daniel say it would take to reconsecrate the sanctuary? How many days did Daniel say it would take to reconsecrate the sanctuary? Uh, 
No, no, Keith. Ty? You pulled anybody over yet? Good. Praise the Lord. Oh, that's right. You've been out with COVID. That's right. Yeah. We got a guess? Okay. Answer is, huh? 442 is incorrect. 2300. That's a lot of days. All right. Still three to one. All right. Here we go. How many, how did God designate 300 soldiers from Gideon's army of 10,000 to take Midian? Bob? <laughs> That's right. They had to cup it, not lap it. There you go. Three to two. Who was King David's great grandfather? Come on, y'all. Y'all know this one. Boaz. That's right. Four to two. So you've got to hope for them to miss. And you guys got to get these next two right. Which... Oh, gosh. <laughs> Which chapter is the middle chapter of the New Testament. <clears throat> Which chapter is the middle chapter of the New Testament? Huh? I almost feel like I should give him multiple choice. That's a hard one. I mean... <laughs> it would be easier. I'm going to give you three guesses. Let's see here. Acts 27. Romans 13. 2 Corinthians 2. That's a hard one. I know. If you guys lose, though, it'll be bad. But you won't lose. Yeah. Yeah. Brad? Why are you saying Romans 13, Brad? You guys agree with that guess? Or? I mean, you got to think, Romans is the sixth book of the New Testament. There's, there's 27 books in the New Testament. First five. Are, are you all with Romans 13? You're right, Romans 13. Three to two. Four to two. Four, four to three. Four to three. All right, this is for the win. Who said to Jesus, command these stones be made of bread? Good job. <laughs> That's like your first ever win, is it? The second? Okay. <laughs> We got to work on winning with grace, Maria. Um, I'm going to give you this last question. <laughs> Gosh. So, <laughs> which book in the New Testament says, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us? First John 
So we finish up five to four for the night. Brother Dave, I've got them warmed up. <laughs> now that I've split the church for you. <laughs> My message tonight is on humbleness and winning. It was very good. You did it well, and it was, had it coming. Amen. Amen. All right. If you got your Bibles, turn to 13 chapters before the middle of the New Testament. <laughs> Which would be Romans, Romans 1. Amen. Amen. So I have a trivia question. Everybody's welcome to take part. Who started the church in Rome? Who started the church in Rome? Or who founded it? Well, Paul never been to Rome. <laughs> huh? No. No, they're right, it's Paul. But Paul was never in Rome until the church had been long established. Amen? So how did Paul be the founder of the church in Rome? More or less. He was, during his missionary journeys, right? A lot of people got saved. A lot of people uh, were from Rome. And they went back to Rome and they started the church in Rome. Amen? But Paul knew a lot about Rome. He wanted to be there and he knew a, a lot about Rome. I mean, he, Rome controlled the whole world. So actually, he walked on Roman streets. He, he, he uh, ate Roman food. I mean, there was a lot of things about Rome that Paul partook of, was part of. Amen? Of course, he didn't eat the stuff he wasn't supposed to eat. But anyway, so Rome, uh, the, the church in Rome was started by Paul, even though he had never been there. He wanted to go there, and he ended up there. But when he wrote this, amen, he wasn't able to go there yet when he wrote Romans. So I just thought that would be a, a good trivia start for this evening, Amen. He, he did Roman customs. He knew all about it. So I decided here about, oh, the first part of May that I was going to, uh, down at the church you all allow me to go to every Sunday and preach, that I was going to preach through Romans. Amen? I've been preaching for 27 years, plus or minus, and I never have done that. I've never took that upon me. I'm not... Uh, worthy of it. I don't think anybody, any expositor that I've ever seen, none of them felt worthy uh, to actually go through Romans and teach Romans. And I'm right with them. Amen. But I just wanted to get a little start tonight. And uh, uh, Bob over there, he keeps saying, I can't wait till you get to Romans 7 and 8. Amen. And I don't know about you guys, if you if you read it sometime, read 7 and 8. And uh Seven, I'm sure glad they're both in there. I'm glad seven's in there because Paul's, Paul has a little bit of trouble with sin in his life. And, uh, I think we all end up in Paul's shoes. Amen. So Martin Luther wrote this about Romans. Listen up. It says the apostle to the Romans is the true masterpiece of the New Testament and the very purest gospel which is well worthy and deserving that a Christian should not only learn it by heart, word for word, but also that he should daily deal with it as the daily bread of men's souls. It can never be too much or too well read or studied. And the more it is handled, the more precious it becomes and the better it tastes. Amen. So Romans is a book that we all ought to be in. We ought to be studying it. We ought to be reading it all the time, amen. Uh, we never can read it enough. We can never know enough about it, amen. But uh, Romans is, 
in the center of the New Testament. Amen? So I've read Romans, I don't know, several times, many times, as probably you all have. And for some reason, I kind of I kind of just read over the second chapter. I mean, the first chapter, we all know, first Paul greets us and he says that he's a, uh, he's a servant of Jesus Christ. In other words, he's a bondsman, a bond slave of Jesus Christ. He does that willingly. God never asks us to do anything we don't want to do. Amen for him. Uh, we need to be willing vessels. And he goes on and, uh, you know, and he gives them their greeting, tells them that he prays for them all the time. Amen. That he's continually in prayer uh, for the church. And you think about Paul's uh, prayer ministry. I mean, Paul had to be on his knees, you would think, almost 24-7. Amen. But Paul was just continually in prayer. He had the habit of praying. I believe Paul just prayed all the time for whatever... Uh, whatever person or church or whatever uh, God brought into his head, but he habitually prayed uh, for the churches and for the people. Amen? And then it goes down, down in there and it, it starts, you know, and he tells us in Romans 1, 16 that, uh, that he's not ashamed of the gospel. Amen? You guys know all that. Everybody knows that, right? And then he goes into 18 about the wrath of God. The wrath of God. <laughs> Oof. Amen. <sighs> I wrote this down about the wrath of God. And I'm not going to read from 18 to the end of the chapter. You guys, I'm sure, know what's there. Amen. And it's funny because the Sunday that I brought this message about the wrath of God was the first Sunday in June, which we all know is Pride Month. Amen. And I thought, oh my goodness, how, how, what a coincidence that that would happen. Amen. As a matter of fact, I'm going to ask you something tonight. If, uh, I, I have put 1250 miles on run keeper, you know, tracking my GPS, my, my walks that I take. And then day before yesterday, they invited me to go on a pride walk. Amen. So I just deleted 1,250 miles of my life. But I'm looking for a Christian one. And I haven't been able to find one. So if you guys know a, a Christian run keeper, amen, I, I would like to know. You can just come to me anytime and let me know. Amen? Make one. Huh? Make one. Make one. Yeah, okay. Maybe you can make one. But I'm old school, all right? All right, but let me read this about the wrath of God. The wrath of God is the holy revulsion of God's being against that which is the contradiction of His holiness. Did you get that? Amen. The wrath of God is the holy revulsion of God's being against that which is the contradiction of His holiness. Amen. And then 18 uh, through 32 goes into all those horrible things that people do. Amen. All those things that bring the, the wrath of God uh, up on them. And then he starts chapter 2. And that's where I want to start this evening. is chapter 2 of Romans. Because once I read that, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, <laughs> I don't do those things. You know, I don't, I, oh my gosh, those horrible people, amen, that do such horrible things. And, uh, and I thought, huh, I'm not like them. And Paul knew I was going to think that, amen? Because Paul says this, listen, the first verse of chapter 2. He says, therefore, thou art inexcusable, O man, whosoever thou art that judgest. For wherein thou judgest another, thou condemnest thyself. For thou that judgest does the same things. Amen? And he says, but we're sure that the judgment of God is according to truth against them which commit such things. And thinkest thou this, O man, that judges them which do such things and doest the same, that thou shalt escape the judgment of God? Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance? Amen. Oh my goodness. Good people don't get it. 
Good people can't get to heaven, amen? Just because you're a do-gooder, it don't work. That's what he's saying. He's saying, oh, you read what I said about them? Guess what? In your heart, you're doing the same things, amen? Oh, maybe not 100%, but you're doing them. You're, there's sin in your life, huh? Whew. He says, he says, listen, he says, you got a problem. And the problem is sin. And you can't get to heaven on your good deeds. You can't get there being a, a, a do-gooder. Amen? But this is what Jesus says. He says, He says that we're guilty. Well, listen to what He says. He says, He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son hath not life. Got to have Jesus. 1 John 5, 12. And in John 5, 24, Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death into life. Got to have Jesus. John 3, uh, 17 and 18. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Are you getting this this evening? Amen. Can't get there on good deeds. Can't get there being a good person. The last one is John 3, 36 that I wrote down. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. Without Jesus, you're lost. That's it. Paul wanted these people to understand how lost they were. Amen. So that they would come to a saving knowledge of Jesus. But then when you look at that back there in the, the first chapter, the end of it there, those people that, uh, that are doing the things that bring the wrath of God, how should we act? How should we react to that? How should we react to them? You guys know the answer. Amen. We should try to get them saved. Amen. Uh, we should have the attitude, amen, of those awful, horrible things that we would want them to get Jesus Christ in their heart. Amen. We would try, what we want to do is get the gospel to those people that are living that life. Amen. And it's all over. We see it everywhere. Can't get away from it. Can't get away from it. Amen. That community. Because they're lost. And they're what? Vocal. They're vocal and lost. Amen. So I wrote down this, this poem, Rescue the Perishing, Care for the Dying, Snatch it in pity from sin in the grave, Weep over the erring ones, Lift up the fallen, Tell them of Jesus, the mighty one to save. Amen. <laughs> Whew. Is it easy? No. Amen. But that's where our hearts ought to be to those lost people that are out there. We ought to be the witness for Jesus Christ in our life. Amen? Amen. Whew. So, then, then I believe old Paul, I believe he puts on his preaching clothes. Amen? He starts getting on them. He starts letting them know. He wants them saved. But in order to get them saved, they got to get them lost. Amen? So he goes into that fifth verse and he says, he says, but after thy hardness and impenitent heart, treasure up in thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of the righteous judgment of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuous in well doing seek for glory and honor and immorality, uh, immortality, eternal life. Amen. Phew. <laughs> there we go. Good deed, do gooders again, amen. He says, You're not going to be able to get there. Revelation tells us, John, he tells us, amen. He says, I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to the works, but it's to no avail, amen. Because in Revelation 20, 15, he says, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into that lake of fire. 
Amen? Whoo! Hard, tough stuff, isn't it? But it's the truth. It's the truth. <sighs> Eternal life is not a reward for effort. It's a gift to those who trust Christ. Amen. Eternal life is not a reward for effort. It's a gift to those who trust Christ. Amen? And then he goes into verse 8. He says, But unto them that are contentious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, indignation, and wrath, tribulation, and anguish upon every soul of man that doeth evil, of the Jew first and also of the Gentile. But glory, honor, and peace to every man that worketh good to the Jew first and also the Gentile. For there is no respect of persons with God. Amen. God plays no favorites. We're all his special ones. I don't know how big his refrigerator is, amen, but however big it is, he's got a picture of you on it because he loves you that much, just like you got your grandkids, amen. He cares about you each and every one and he cares about us all the same and he loves us, amen, because he has no respect to person. He has no pets, amen. So the question tonight, the question Paul's asking is, do you have a Savior? Do you have a Savior? Have you asked Jesus Christ into your heart? Are you walking and talking and living it? Amen. Do you have that Savior? Phew, and he goes on. Amen. Oh my goodness. This one's a little convicting. Look at verse 12. He says, For as many have sinned without the law shall also perish without the law. And as many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are law unto themselves, which show the work of law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the mean while accusing or else excusing one another. Verse 16, And the day when God shall judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. The question tonight is, do you want those secrets brought out? Amen? You know those secret things you keep inside that nobody knows about? Huh? Amen? Or maybe you don't, but I do, and I'm sure you do too. There's things I don't want you all to know about, about my thoughts, amen, that I fight all the time. Huh? And he says, listen, he says, they're, they're going to be brought out, amen. Uh, not the good and great things, but those dirty little thoughts, amen. <laughs> so, well, Brother Dave, what do I do? Flee to Jesus. That's our only hope. That's what he's trying to get these guys to do. That's what you and I need to do, amen. Just run to Jesus. Say, Jesus, I'm a mess, amen. Let your Holy Spirit clean me up, work on me. I need it, and I'm going to need it till the day I leave this place and come and be with you. Amen? Woo, those dirty little secrets. They're going to be exposed. <laughs> Amen? <sighs> I'm glad I don't have any. I don't know about the rest of you all. You're kind of nodding at me and stuff. Amen? Huh? And then listen, Paul says, listen, Jews. He loves the Jews. He wants them saved. He wants them coming to Jesus. But he's saying, listen, you Jews have 10 advantages he's going to list here in a minute over the Gentiles. He says, he says, you guys ought to be the one that's getting this. You guys ought to be the one that's coming, uh, coming to Christ. Amen. <laughs> he says this. <laughs> and where do I want? In 17. He says, behold, thou art called a Jew and resist in the law. And making thy boast of God, and knowing his will, and approveth the things that are more excellent, be instructed out of the law, and are confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, and light of them which are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, a teacher of the babes, which has the form of knowledge, and of the truth in the law. Amen. He says they have these advantages. He says, number one is, they bear the name Jew. The Jews were God's people. Amen? And I was thinking, uh-oh, Paul, I think maybe you're writing this to me because I'm not a Jew, but I bear the name of Jesus. I call myself a Christian. Don't you? Amen? We call ourselves Christians. We bear the name of God. Amen? 
It ought to show in our life. He's saying, listen, you have that advantage. He says, then, he says, he says, you, your, your life rests upon the law. Upon the law. And we know that the law, we know the law. We know the Ten Commandments. Amen. We know what we ought not to do. Huh? And I know that we can't follow the law all the time because of our human nature. But the law to us, he says, they boast of the law. The law to us is that mirror. Is a mirror that's reflecting back the, the things in our life that need to be straightened up. The things in our life that need to be forgiven. Amen. So we have, we boast of the law also as a mirror that's reflecting uh, our sin that's in our life. Amen. And then he says, he says, you boast in God. You boast in God. We talk about God's love all the time as Christians. Huh? We, we know that God loves us. He cares for us. We know that, uh, that he sent his son to die for us. He says, he said, and you, they know the will of God. Amen. They know the will of God. Sounds like a Christian to me. Amen. And proves the things which are more excellent being instructed. Amen. And then he goes, he goes into, uh, into, into verse 19. And he says, and are confident that thou thyself are a guide of the blind. Ha! Or a, a light to them which are in darkness. Sound familiar? Amen. Huh? <laughs> An instructor of the foolish, a teacher of babes, which has a form of knowledge of the truth and the law. Amen. So we're persuaded that, that they're a guide to the blind. Isn't that what we are? Amen. Isn't that what I was talking about? Amen. That those blind people out there that are, that are living the life of the wrath of God, that are blind to Jesus Christ, we're a guide to them. Our life should show Jesus uh, to bring what? The light. They were the light. Amen. It's up to us to bring the light to a dark and dying world, right? Amen. Yes, Brother Dave, it is. Huh? Whoo! He's talking to Jews have this advantage. Guess what, guys? We have the same advantages. As Christians, as Jesus followers, amen? A light of them in the darkness, a, a corrector of the thoughtless or the immature, a teacher of babes or proselytes. Well, I had to look up proselytes. You know what a proselyte is? <laughs> well, you're going to. It's one who switched recently from one religion to another. Amen? From one religion to another. So those people that come into the church and they're serving the devil or whatever they're serving. Amen. When they come in, they get Jesus Christ in their heart. He said that the Jews ought to be the ones that's teaching them, that's bringing them up, that's, that's making them mature uh, in the church. And brothers and sisters, that's what we're here for, right? We see people get saved at this altar. We see them get baptized. Amen. And then sometimes we just never see them again. Huh? Amen. All right. He says, he says, uh, ha having the law, uh, 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 the law, the outward form of knowledge and truth. Amen. And he says, oh my gosh, I'm telling you, Paul's preaching tonight. Listen to verse 21. He says, thou therefore would teach us another, teachest thou not thyself? <laughs> huh? <laughs> he says, Thou that preachest a man should not steal, do you steal? Thou that sayest a man should not commit adultery, do you commit adultery? Thou that abhorrest idols, dost thou commit sacrilege? Thou that makest thy boast in the law through breaking the law dishonors God, for the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles <laughs> through you as it is written. <sighs> Oh my gosh. Amen. Is he laying it on him or not? Huh? He says, he says, you've got all these advantages. Do you practice what you preach? Are you living what you say you're living? Do you, do you do outside of these walls what you say you're doing on the inside of these walls? Do you practice it at home in front of your family, in front of your loved ones? Do you practice it at Walmart? Do you practice it at, at the places where you go and the people you see and the people that God puts around you? He says, hey, he says, can they see the sin in your life? Whoo. I'll never forget, I know a preacher friend of mine. 
And he pulled up at 13 and he's messing with one of his deacons. He's in front of him, amen? <laughs> he's, he's messing with him physically with the car, okay? He pulls up alongside him. He don't know he's there and he gives him that, that one finger wave. And it's to his pastor, amen? Uh, whoo. Do you practice what you preach? Amen. Everywhere you go, that's what Paul's saying. Amen. Uh, I wrote this down. I, I found it. It's the gospel is written a chapter a day by the deeds that you do and the words that you say. Men read what you say, whether faceless or true. Say, what is the gospel according to you? That's what Paul's saying. Amen. That's what he's saying. And then he starts, I'm about done, but then he gets into the heart of the matter, to the true heart. Amen? <laughs> He's saying, listen, you Jews, you show outwardly that you're God's people. You have a mark. Amen? Which I'm going to say the word about 10 times here in a minute. Amen? <sighs> Let's just read it. Verse 25. For circumcision verily profit us, if thou keep the law, but if thou be a break of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. Therefore, if the uncircumcision keep the righteousness of the law, shall not to his uncircumcision be counted for circumcision. And shall not the uncircumcision, which is by nature, if it fulfill the law, judge thee, who by the letter and circumcision does transgress the law. 28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart. Of the heart. In the spirit. And not in the letter. Whose praise is not of man, but of God. Amen. Circa, he's saying, listen. Circumcision should stand for something. Your mark that you're one of God's person should mean something. It shouldn't be just an outward show and you go and live your life according to however you want to live it. Amen? It should show that you're a God person. <sighs> Moses in Deuteronomy 10, 16, he says, Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Amen? And I'm thinking, well, what do we do as Christians to show, show the world that, that we love Jesus? I mean, we walk the walk and talk the talk, and we live our lives in front of, in front of the world. But there's, there's something that we do. We accept Jesus Christ in our heart. Amen? And then, as Baptists, we get baptized. And why do we get baptized? To show the world. To show the world what we've done. To show the world that we've accepted Jesus Christ into our heart. Amen? To show them that we're set apart different now. Amen? We take communion. We take the, uh, the communion. Amen? Because we believe uh, that it, it uh, represents the blood that Jesus shed for us and the body that He broke for us. Amen? We do those things. Outwardly, but in our heart, in our heart, amen, in our heart. He says, he says, you show like you're Jews physically. He says, but where's your heart? Where's your heart? Wow. I mean, I've thrown a bunch at you tonight, haven't I? Amen, a whole chapter. Almost in the middle of the Bible we learned, <laughs> right? Huh? But it boils down to this. Where's your heart? When you see these people that are, are living completely against God's will, that they're deserving of God's wrath, I get discouraged with them. I get disgusted with them. I, I you know, I love golf. And I saw a commercial the other day where they say everybody's welcome and they're all in golf carts with the pride flag. And I'm like, oh my gosh, golf's a sacred. But it's not, amen. 
It's just like everything else, huh? But how should I react to those people? In love. In love. It's hard. Amen? But our heart should go out because we want them to know Jesus Christ and we want them to be saved as well as your worst enemy in this world. We don't want anybody to go to hell. Paul wanted these people to understand, amen, that they can't do it on their own. They have to have Jesus. They cannot do it by good deeds. They cannot do it by the outward showing of their flesh and their actions, amen. They could only do it through accepting Jesus Christ in their heart. And boy, when you do that, your heart should go out to those that are lost and dying. Amen? Amen. You guys got any questions or any anything to add to this chapter? I, I have read this a lot and I kind of just skip over it for some reason. But boy, Paul has really given us a great chapter in the Bible, hasn't he? Amen? Amen. You got anything? Yeah, we're, we're to love because the first part was about homosexuals and despising. How, how do we show love without being involved in sex? I don't want to accept that lifestyle from anyone. No. But I want to show them that I love them, but I don't love their behavior. He wants to show them that we love them, but we don't love their behavior. Exactly. That's it, isn't it? We love them. Well, I don't know that you can always do that. You do it to the best you can because it, it will be argumentative, you know. You can't, you can't do it through argument. You can just do it through your life. A guy, uh, you know, we got all these car washers that I go to all every Monday. And uh, the electrician was there here a couple of weeks ago. I'd never met him before. And uh, he was showing me about how he's trying to keep the light. Water and electricity does not work well together. Amen. He's putting lights in to where they might last a little bit. And he says, Dave, uh, we just, you know, boom, I knew he was a Christian. And we started talking, you know. And I'm like, I said, listen, I said, these guys, I said, when these people go into this automatic, I said, I tell them, I'll stand there and tell them, you know, I'll, when the attendant's not there, Beverly and I's there, I'll do their wheels, you know, spray their wheels and, and take their money and give them a, we, we pass out a dash wipe, amen, for everybody that goes through and give them a dash wipe. And I'll say, now listen, this first part, go through really slow because it, it washes your undercarriage. It, as soon as you get in there, whoosh, and it washes your undercarriage, gets all that stuff off the bottom. I said, so go really slow. And I go, okay, whoom, right in there. And, it, and it's going whoosh, up on the lights, amen, which we're having trouble keeping going. And I'm like, I'm like, man, I said, I tried to tell you. He says, Dave, you can't, try, you can't tell anybody anything. He says, you just can't tell them. He said, I have this young man that's come to work with me. He said, he's an agnostic, which I honestly don't even know what that is, but obviously it's not a Christian, amen? And he says, this guy's telling him that his friends tell him this and his friends tell him that. And he says, he says, I want to know. He says, you just tell me about being Christian. Why should I be a Christian? He says, I want your answer to that question. And he says, you know what, Dave? He says, you just can't tell people. He says, you know what I told him? He said, watch me. He said, you'll be working with me day after day after day. He says, you watch me in my life. He says, you see if, I haven't, if I'm not a Jesus person. He says, you just watch my walk. He says, he says, you just see if I'm not walking with the Lord. Amen. If I don't have Jesus Christ in me. I said, how's that going? He says, six months in. He said, so far, he says, he's not a Christian yet. He said, but he's watching me. Amen. He's watching my life. And that's the only answer I got. Amen. I have to watch our lives. Watch our lives. Because it's hard. Woo. Jim, it's hard. It's hard for me. Well, there, and what I said earlier about them being thankful, you and I are close to the same age. 
you and I can both remember when it was said. What I do in the privacy of my own bed uh, is my own affair. Right. And we acquiesced, we gave in to that. He said, okay, well, I don't want to know what you do in the bed. I don't tell you what I do in my bed. Leave it alone. But then it started eking out. Right. And then their behavior became more effeminate okay. or masculine or whatever their thing is. And all of a sudden, here we are in the last <coughs> 10 to 20 years, we have pride parades, and if you don't participate in my pride parade, you're a racist or you're a homophobe or All right. a deviant. How am I deviant? My behavior's not being deviant, well, but you can't fight with them because then you're not showing them love. I think sometimes you have to be able to argue on the side of God with reason and not just say, okay, because we've acquiesced and we've given up so much ground that now they want to teach our kindergarten. Sure, right, we know. You know? So Paul says this, he says, uh, he says they'll invent ways, amen, and they'll invite others in. I didn't read that part, but that's what he says, amen. They'll invent new ways to sin and they'll invite people in. And that's the world, man, you know what the Bible says. It's going to get worse and worse, not better and better. So we're living it. So we live our lives as best we can with Jesus in our heart and showing them Jesus, amen, and uh, pray for them and do what's right. And off we go, amen. Let's pray. Father God, I do love you and praise you, Lord. I thank you for this word that's in the Bible, Lord. We know that this world around us is crazy. And uh, Lord, we know that there's all kinds of sin going on. So Lord, we pray that you would hold your wrath back just a little bit longer. Lord, because some of these people are going to come to Jesus. Some of these people. Your word says that they, they know in their heart that you're real. And they can see it in the, in the way that the world is made, in the way the universe is made, and in the sky, Lord, that, that you exist. So, Lord, I'm praying that that knowledge you just make bigger and bigger and bigger where they truly come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. And I pray, Lord, we as Christians, that we would walk the tall walk and talk the talk, that we would be the light, that would be, we would be a guide to the blind to bring them into that light. And, Lord, we would be those that, that bring people up through the faith. Lord, we love you and praise you, and it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Yes. Or me, I don't know about Bob. Amen.